<laughs> Told you I'd be back. Tonight's episode features a good friend. Jeffrey Knott is a man who is far too humble for his own good. Jeff's career in the restaurant business spans almost 20 years, and along with his partner in crime, Pat Bolster, was instrumental in bringing craft bartending to our hometown of Pensacola. Jeff's career highlights include being a member of the founding staff of Old Hickory Whiskey Bar, which has gone on to win numerous national awards over the last five years, bartending at the renowned Sazerac Bar in New Orleans' world-famous Roosevelt Hotel, as well as competing and advising in numerous cocktail competitions across the country, including Diageo World Class. I personally ordered my first whiskey from Jeff when Old Hickory first opened. We became friends, and he ended up fishing me out of a river several years later, but that is its own story. I am proud to call Jeff a friend and grateful to have him on this podcast. I invite you to sit back and enjoy my conversation with Jeffrey Knott. So Jeff, how's it going? Good, man. How are you? Hanging in. <laughs> the building project here is about to about to run me down, but it's it's come to an end, so that's that's good. Well, I'm not spotting any grays yet, man. So you're you're doing all right. Cool, so. cool. It's a lot of caffeine and a belt holding me together right now. <laughs> that's all you need in life. No, no, for real. But no, I appreciate you coming out today because um, after the last podcast with Alex, he texted me immediately and said, "Hey, you need to talk to Jeff. That'd be fun." Because <laughs> um, have you, have you and Alex worked together before? Because right now, just for frame of reference, for people who don't know you, you are bartending in iron. Correct. But that is the tip of a very large iceberg of <laughs> your career. Uh, yeah, that's just one of the, the many in 12 or so years of bartending and 20 years or so in the restaurant business. So it's, yeah, this is one, one spot on the map. But uh, no, Alex and I haven't haven't worked together before. I've just known him for, for quite a few years and... Uh, I've always been a fan of of Iron. I was going back when they were on Marcus Point every chance I got. I mean, unfortunately, it wasn't super convenient to get out there back then. But <laughs> yeah. since they moved downtown a few years back, like it's it's wrecked my wallet on a, on a few nights. So <laughs> not mad about it one bit. And then getting to, uh, to join the team about a year and a half ago was pretty awesome. So it's one of the, the best gigs I've ever had, honestly. So Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they really are leveling up the game for this whole area. Oh, absolutely. It's been cool to watch. I always say, like, if you could take that place brick for brick and, and move it into to pretty much any city on earth, like, I think it would still hold its own pretty damn well. So, yeah, I assume I can swear on here, by the way. Oh, yeah. OK. Yeah. Of course. yeah. <laughs> as soon as I said that, I was like, oh. <laughs> no, no. Liberty Hall and anything you want to say. Oh, man. Fits. You were in for some good dick jokes then. Good. Good. Love those. No, my mom does listen to this, but she'll she'll be OK. Hi, Steven's mom. I'm sorry in advance. <laughs> no, um. No, you, you did do something at Jackson's at one point, didn't yeah, you? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I wondered if you and Alex had ever worked together there. No, m- missed them there. at Jackson's. Um, that was actually kind of where I got started into the, the cocktail side of things. It was uh, the bar manager I had then, Josh Goldman, uh, who's actually over at uh, Taco Agave now. Um, he kind of showed me that, hey, there's these cocktail books and there's these amazing bars in New York. Like The, the first one he ever showed me was the, the PDT cocktail book. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just... My, my jaw hit the floor because I had been bartending for six or seven years before that. And I took a break for a little while. And then when I got to Jackson, he showed me that I was like, oh, wait, I can actually be proud of what I'm making <laughs> and not just cash in a paycheck. Because, I mean, don't get me wrong. There's good money in, in pretty much every style of bartending if you do it well. So, but the longevity and the the mental well-being isn't, isn't there if you're not happy with what you're doing. Yeah. And I never was when I was just slinging drinks and if I didn't know how to make something, it was red and sweet. And that was just the way we did things almost 20 years ago. <laughs> now it's like, oh, crap, I can actually learn about these things because we've got the world's resources in our pocket nowadays with powerful mm-hmm. computers. And you can you can find out what all these ingredients are and you can find all these these recipes from all over the country and you can educate yourself to whatever extent you really want. Yeah, and, so. and for a frame of reference, I mean, there's kind of been a uh, a little bit of a cocktail uh, revolution in recent years, and because I'm not directly in the industry, I always describe myself as bar industry adjacent because I come in and take pictures, and I and I know a lot of the people in Pensacola who are the professionals here, but it's it's the things I hear from you that inform me as to what's going on, and uh, I've always wondered, you know, 
when did it really start when people start taking cocktails seriously? And cause there's the, the movie cocktail from the eighties, which glorifies <laughs> it and makes it look really sexy, but that they're not making very good drinks in that movie. Not likely. No. <laughs> and, um, uh, I mean, I'm not going to dismiss Tom Cruise's cocktail making ability. Cause I'm sure he's, he's probably good at that. Like he is at every damn thing else. Um, <laughs> Hyper competent, but yeah, times. what what I saw in that movie was probably not solid drinks. Yeah, but you know, to each their own. Yeah, um, I mean, I would say from from what I've gathered, obviously I wasn't there, but a big part of it kind of started in in New York, at least in the, the United States, um, probably about fifteen years or so ago. Um, that's when kind of the the quote unquote cocktail renaissance really kicked off, from what I've gathered. And of course, you know, Pensacola is a good 10 years behind the curve. So, <laughs> you know, it was seven, eight years ago for us is when it really started to, to hit with places like five and a half. Um, and then kind of slowly but surely it's built up a little bit from there. And we're still still growing. But, yeah. you know, yeah. places like, you know, Milk and Honey in, in New York and then PDT, Death and Company, Employees Only, all these places that are coming up on you know, being around for 10 years or more, we're, we're kind of on the, the forefront of that. And I'm sure if we had a larger population, we could afford to have, you know, a dozen or two really amazing cocktail bars that we'd have the population to support it, but we, we don't hear. So we get a few at a time, which right. is unfortunate, right. but it's baby steps. Well, it's been really neat to see the, the restaurants take it seriously. You know, most of the restaurants in Pensacola, at least the good, you know, the, the higher end restaurants where you need a reservation. I mean, yeah. most of them have a pretty decent, you know, bar staff or bar program or whatever the proper term is. It seems like they're at least, you know, you go to places like Iron, of course, and, um, or, um, not, sorry, I was trying to say, um, a union, mm-hmm. you know, there's good people and good drinks there. I mean, it seems like the restaurants have really been, been taking it seriously. Yeah. And I, I think it, it's just cause Drinking has started to follow the suit of the way we've been thinking about eating for years. That people are starting to care about what goes into their beverages and not just, you know, they, they've heard the term old fashioned on a movie or a TV show and they want that and they don't care what it is. Now right. they actually care and they're concerned with what whiskey are you using? You know, how do you go about the, how can I make this at home or, or what's the process? What bitters do I need to buy? Um, I mean, it's just like, like I said, following the, the food trends of like, how do you get that amazing sear on the steak that you do? You know, mm-hmm. what's your trick behind that? Like they want to know our, not just the ingredients, but our tricks and our process now too. So yeah, it's, it's definitely becoming a, a thing where you're starting to see everybody have a quote unquote cocktail program or, mm-hmm. or some sort of beverage director kind of guiding them the process. And that's a really cool thing to see. Yeah. And as I recall, when was it that Five and a Half opened and started taking off? Was it 2000? I think 2010. 2010. Okay, that's what I, that's what I thought. So you, were you on the founding staff of that or did you come in? Cause no, I didn't get there until 2011, 2012. Okay. Um, so it had already been around for about a year and a half, two years. Uh, Pat Bolster had been running that for, for a while. Um, I don't I'll remember who all was on the original staff, I, I believe. I think Joe Abston was there for a little while as part of the beginning. Um, I know Mike McLaughlin was there for a little while. Um, I'm sure there's a few more. Um, it's a small place, so there, obviously there wasn't a huge staff to it, but there's been a few people that have come and gone through through those doors before I got there. Um, but that was, that was a huge step in my learning process was going there. And like I said, I'd already been kind of introduced to the ability to make cocktails and care about what I was doing. And when I was at Jackson's, when I left Jackson and went to five and a half, like getting just to work with, with Pat in any aspect was, was great because he's always been such a, a fountain of just, I don't want to say useless knowledge, but you can ask the guy anything <laughs> about damn near any subject and he's going to have an answer for you. So it was really cool to, to learn and have him be kind of one of my, my mentors, even though he's younger than I am, uh, <laughs> coming up and, and learning a lot. It was it was. It was like having, like I said, like having the smartphone, but I just had, hey, Pat, what's this? You know? Yeah. I, I didn't have to type anything, and he just knew. <laughs> so that, that was great in my development, because one thing that we always kind of worked on was like five and a half was, was the first place I worked that had a pretty extensive back bar, like mm-hmm. all sorts of Amaros and different, you know, agaves and different rums and stuff like that that I never played around with before. And one thing that we always worked on was like getting to the point where you knew everything that was on that back bar and how to use it 
Right. So if somebody was like, just make me something with that and pointed to a random bottle, you had an answer for it. Right. And what, what was the jump like? Because what, as I recall it, I mean, there are a lot of bars in Pensacola. It's a Navy town. Like, it, there's not a lot to do in the Pensacola evenings if you don't drink. drink. Yeah, yeah. It's, we're basically a big liver. <laughs> but five and a half was like, even though it's attached to a venue, it, I mean, formally, rest in peace. I mean, yeah. it, it was like the first place that built itself as being a craft cocktail bar. It wasn't a restaurant with a good bar. It wasn't you know, a, a place like Intermission, which is just beer and shots and basic stuff. It was like, you come here for a constructed right. cocktail. And I had my uh, my uncle uh, in the business he's in deals with a lot of people from out of town. And I was hearing, you know, just from being in proximity with him during some projects I helped with, people from Chicago were coming down here and looking and finding out that Five and a Half was the only place to go. And they were speaking super highly of having a place in Pensacola before it really exploded a few right. years ago, a place to go to get a really good cocktail because these were people with money to burn, used to large markets, options, and they would come here and be really happy with it. And I always thought that was really cool because y'all y'all kind of spearheaded the movement to a certain extent of freestanding craft cocktail yeah, bars. Absolutely. Yeah, Five and a Half was definitely the, the first you know cocktail bar we had here, like you said, other than you know restaurant bars where you might be able to get a, a decent martini or a Manhattan or something like that, but they weren't really, to my knowledge, doing anything super inventive maybe a, a basil lemon drop might be on the menu which again nothing wrong with it if you do it well you do it well but i i wouldn't consider that like cutting edge by any means either right um and what we did at that five and a half wasn't necessarily cutting edge either but it was more inventive ingredients kind of interesting pairings instead of just taking a classic and putting a minor tweak on it right so, so that's kind of where we we started off with that and then obviously through the success of five and a half uh, we were able to do stuff with like what we did at Old Hickory, um, Union Public House. Um, I know what Old Hickory is doing with the Kennedy coming up is going to be awesome. So it's just we're starting to get multiple spots, and that's mm-hmm. that's really great. I know uh, they're doing some fun things over at the district, the uh, you new know, steakhouse by Seville. So mm-hmm. some things will will never change. Fish House is always going to be Fish House. Seville is always going to be Seville, and you know that's that's their bread and butter. They can they can do that and good for them. There's nothing wrong with it. So, I mean, the, the institutions are self-supporting. I mean, it, it's kind of like places on the beach. It's like they say, oh, we have great advertising. I'm like, that's fine, but you don't really need it because people are going to come regardless. Absolutely. They hear about you. Yeah, um, McGuire's could spend no money the rest of their existence in advertising and they're still going to be busy every damn night. Yeah, everyone in the world says when you go to Pensacola, go to McGuire's. Yep. You, you don't need anything to tell you that. People will, people will find you and tell you that. I almost feel like an idiot sometimes because that's also me. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm just like tapping people on the forehead. Have you been there yet? Have you yeah, been there yet? It's a good absolutely. steak. It's a good burger. It, it's always on one of my lists of anytime people are like, hey, we're new to town. You know, what, what do we need to check out? Or, you know, we've got four days here. Give us your top X amount of things to go do. And I'm always like, go check out McGuire's, man. It's mm-hmm. it's a it's an Irish pub. But, I mean, you're going to get a dang good burger. The, the, uh, the beers that they make in house are killer. Really good Irish coffee. Their whiskey selection is pretty decent. You, I mean, unless you're uppity, you can't find anything wrong with that place. Right, right. So, so, so moving on from five and a half, I mean, kind of stage two, I guess you could say, Pensacola's cocktail scene was Old Hickory, and that was where I first met you. Right. And you, uh, you were the man, bar manager there. And how how did you see that as like the the evolution of like for a local or regional scene because we're we're just far enough away from New Orleans that we're not really absorbed into that conversation or the mobile conversation for that matter. Yeah. So, I mean, for like this this small area just growing up, how did you see things evolving at that time? Old Hickory was a huge step. So I I, I left five and a half um, in two thousand twelve. Don't quote me on that. I don't know. Um, and I, I went to the wine bar, um, uh, cause Ian Cable, the owner, uh, approached me cause they were getting their liquor license. So they were going to stop doing just beer and wine. They were going to expand and do liquor. And he wanted me to help them start doing a bar program, some pretty easy cocktails cause they're always going to be a wine bar. Mm-hmm. Um, they're always going to serve food. They're just, that was their, their bread and butter, obviously, but they also wanted to expand into that. So, uh, it kind of gave me the chance to do my own thing. Aside from like being being Pat's sidekick, which is pretty great, don't get me wrong, but it was a chance to kind of write my own name down in the books. Um, so I went and did that. Um, 
got that up and running and that was that was fun it was a good gig but about six months into that um i met katie and tony garrett the owners of the whiskey bar um they had started coming in it's kind of at random and they would always be like talking about it was it was very clear that they were talking about plans for something coming up and as they would come in like once a week or so i started picking up more and more about it and one time i want to say tony came in with blueprints and i noticed that it was pretty obviously going to be a bar or a restaurant of some kind <clears throat> so of course that that kind of piqued my interest and them being whiskey drinkers i was a whiskey drinker still am um kind of bonded over buffalo trace over the, the the trips that they would have there and then finally one day i was just like i cut through all the bullshit i was like so you're doing a whiskey bar right and they're like yes <laughs> and i was like do you have anybody in mind to run this and they said no and i was like well if you're interested i know a guy that guy is me Tell me when. I am somebody. Yeah, I'm a human, <laughs> sort of. Um, and yeah, they, they were like, well, yeah, we were kind of, we were wondering, you know, kind of tiptoeing around it. And I just, and we all kind of just cut through the bullshit at that point. We're like, okay, let's do this. So <laughs> um, in my my possibly overzealousness, I was like, you know, the day you guys sign the lease, let me know. And the day they signed the lease, I put in my two weeks at the wine bar and then spent four months helping build Old Hickory. So Probably could have hung on a little bit longer at the wine bar <laughs> instead of going broke. Um, but hey, it, it, was a, it was a great experience. I mean, I, I have no ownership in the place, but I, I literally got to help build that thing. Mm -hmm. the, the demolition of the previous space was the more fun part, but the, the, the building was pretty damn cool too. Um, so that being said, I, uh, I had a lot of blood, sweat, and tears that went into to building Old Hickory, and I think that that's what helped make it such an impactful thing for me, and I think that showed through on a lot of other people that, that came in to visit, they saw how important it was to us because we, we got to do that. And it being, like you said, kind of the second phase of like the, the cocktail drinking culture, whatever you want to call it, growth in Pensacola, <clears throat> I think was in large part due to the fact that it did mean so much. Um, I feel like, honestly, we probably could have done anything in that spot and it would have been fine. Yeah. But the fact it was a whiskey bar... <clears throat> Being, you know, three hours from New Orleans, four hours from Atlanta, you know, if you drive like I do at least, maybe five <laughs> hours from Atlanta, you know, three hours from Tallahassee, like there's not another major city around here. Mobile's a pretty good sized place, but it's just now in the last couple of years starting to come into its own too. So right. Mobile wasn't even really in the equation at that point. Um, <clears throat> kind of lost myself there for a second. Oh, uh, but yeah, just the fact that we offer something essentially in the middle of like a dead zone between all these major cities it was really easy for us to kind of pop up on the map pretty quickly. And it, that wasn't even part of the plan. We just wanted to add something really cool to Pensacola. It turned out to be something that was really kind of cool for the whole kind of Southeast region. And now almost nationally, like I've got friends all over the place that have heard of, of old Hickory. Um, but oh. yeah, we, we started out doing, you know, cocktails. And I think the first order we had a whopping 60 whiskeys on the shelves. Cause it was like, we just need to get these doors open before the bills run out. Let's, or before the money runs out, we can't pay the bills. Like let's, let's open. And we had, I want to say 60 or 65 whiskeys and we ran out of damn near everything the first like three days. <laughs> and then, uh, I think Katie would just like just order whatever the hell you want the next time. So we went from like 60 or 65 to, I want to say probably 200 within the next like week or so. Mm -hmm. So it was a really quick growth on that part. And then God, no, I want to say they've got almost 700 now if I'm, guessing right oh so, they, they cracked 700 and i think if you count like the special stuff they keep under lock and key it's closer to like 900 at this geez. point yeah there's there's several closets full that are just i'm like, just happy i don't have to do inventory there anymore <laughs> yeah i mean it's it's one of those things where like you're saying that that sort of handcrafted you know family aspect really showed through i mean and we were talking about this earlier before the mics went on is that you know i i walked in there originally for the name just because old hickory going back to andrew jackson you know that's my my heritage a little bit. Which um, I didn't know. That's very cool. Yeah, yeah. My uh I, let me count it off. It's my great, 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 great grandfather. So that, that was it, a lot of fingers you were counting on there. Yeah. Well, I'm I glad mean, we didn't get over twenty one. I, I, I need 20. them. <laughs> That's why I'm a photographer. I, I don't do <laughs> the numbers well. Um yeah. So anyway, that was the whole reason I went in. And I wasn't even a whiskey guy. I drank some red wine occasionally and that was it. But then I walked in there and 
it was opening weekend, so I'm looking at even just the 60 or so you had on the wall and had no idea what to order. So I'm three deep away, and you were you were the one who took my order that night, actually, before we ever became friends. I and wish I could say I remember that. I, I don't. I only remember <laughs> it because I remember the anxiety of being in line. I had no idea what to order. You I just catch the stare from me. What do yeah. you want? <laughs> and you were, you were crisscrossing with, um, gosh, I don't even remember who was the starting staff. I remember, I think Kelly was there. but I uh, mean, Kelly came on quickly after, but, but she okay. wasn't on the start. Um, it was okay. literally the first bartender was me, second one was Melissa, and then uh, Kyle that also worked at Five and a Half. Okay. Uh, Pat's brother-in-law. Gotcha. So we were the first three, and then Kelly and Noel were probably within about a month or so after. Okay. Maybe two months. but I just remember quick. a lot of people crisscrossing fast in front of me, and I, <laughs> I didn't remember who was who. But I, I ordered a McAllen, just a very, like, young McAllen <laughs> that I could afford. and and I uh, have this many dollars. <laughs> What can this buy me? <laughs> that was pretty much it. Yeah, I just started. Uh, I just started my first big kid job at the time, so I was I was looking to feel like somebody, <laughs> but I had no idea what I was doing. And now I, I walk in at the end of a long day, like a like a factory worker in the fish. It's like, <laughs> can I get a beer and a shot, please? It's been a day, and they just know what to give you at this point. <laughs> yeah. Well, now Darren tries to hurt me because if I get anywhere near the bottom of either one, he pops a new one on the bar. I'm like, dude, stop it. It's yeah, Tuesday. That's why I feel like if I'm going to take a break from drinking or something like that, I need to tell people ahead of time because I'll still go in the bars and still go see my friends. But like if I walk into the Azalea before my butt hits a seat, there's a Miller High Life on the bar. So I feel like I'm going to have to message Damien or Michaela or whoever's working that <laughs> night and be like, look, I'm not drinking right now. I'm just going to come say hey. So like, don't open a beer. <laughs> Could you stop being hospitable yeah, for like how, 10 seconds? Stop being so damn good at your job. <laughs> that, that was the funny thing about Darren. Speaking of, of people we brought on, like I met Darren not probably within the first year we opened Old Hickory because I, I know he came on very early, but I met him at uh, Pensacola Martini Fest and just immediately like fell in love with the guys. One of the sweetest people on the planet. Uh, he was working at Jocko's at the time and through talking, he didn't really have much in the way of like craft cocktail experience, just what they'd done at Jocko's, which is still a pretty decent drink program they have over there. Um, <clears throat> it's gotten better over the last couple of years, but at the time it was still kind of like what I was saying earlier about like Jackson's or Global Grill, where it was like, get a solid martini, solid Manhattan. Um, but yeah, he was just like, you know, I'm kind of not really into this, but I'm just here to kind of represent Jocko's. And I was like, I just, something about the guy just clicked with me. Mm -hmm. And I was immediately just like, you're going to work for me. Because he's had this this charm and demeanor about him where he just like will captivate you and just like a two sentence conversation. And you're just like, shit, this guy's rad. <laughs> uh, so I was like, I don't care if you learn how to make any drinks, learn any whiskeys, like people, people wait in line for you. It's like yeah. we could be three or four deep at the bar and they're like, oh no, we're fine. We're going to wait on Darren. <laughs> I'm like, that buys me so much more time. I'm yeah. fine with that. Uh, he's, he's great for, for crowd control. So I mean, it's, it's like the, the skinniest, sweetest bouncer you're ever going to meet. It's just like everybody just kind of pacifies around him. So yeah, yeah the, he's pretty much anybody that's, that's come through old Hickory that I've gotten a chance to work with. It's, we were lucky to be able to handpick and, and select for the reasons like Noel, I'd been harassing for a long time to, to try to get into the game with me over there. Uh, Kelly, I've known for 15, 16 years at that point. Uh, we started fish house together you know, back when we were both in the early 20s. Um, she had been out of the business for a while, and I eventually harassed her enough to, to start working for us on the weekends around her big kid job, and now she's running the place. So That's been a cool evolution, because I remember when, when I was first introduced to Kelly, she was like, there was like two of her. She was like bartender Kelly, but also graphic designer Kelly. Right. And I know she did graphic design full-time and before coming back to Old Hickory, but she's really found her stride. Um, focusing on whiskey and focusing on old hickory and just really seems to be kind of emerging as like a personality in the field now. Like, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's been she, really it, cool to it's see. It's very clear to see that, that she loves it and she's just uber dedicated to it. Like mm -hmm. she spends probably even more time than, than I do looking at, you know, stuff online or reading up on articles or, or following this and following that. Like she's 90% of her day is probably tied into to learning and moving forward. And that's a really great thing to see. And that's exactly what a place like Old Hickory needs is somebody that's dedicated to, to keeping it fresh and, and staying up with what's going on in the world around. Yeah, and, and on a more like granular level, like her being a woman in that industry is really cool because Katie is a woman in the industry. Absolutely. It's kind of 
not a complete singularity, but she, she's rare. Fortunately, it, it's getting less rare. Yeah, say it's, it's becoming more common, but still not terribly common. Yeah, she, she kind of broke into that, and it's it's really it's on brand for Old Hickory that now Kelly is following suit and emerging yeah. as another personality from the bar in the industry. I heard that she, uh, Tony told me, like, last time there was a conference, she was, like, in an advisor capacity or something, and that would, or or something. But they, they invited, like, a select group of people to do something different. It and could very well be. It's just, honest to God, it's getting very hard to keep track of what <laughs> everybody I know is doing at yeah. this point. Like, I barely know what I'm doing next. So um, I, I believe you're probably talking about PDX, if I'm guessing. I think that was it, that, yeah. I think that was one of the more recent things she went and did. So, yeah. But, yeah, she was, she was there as, like, a an advisor and then yeah there was she had people she had to keep track of and yeah and was kind of one of the the leaders of that group so yeah it, and it's, it's very cool to get to see a lot of us doing things outside of Pensacola too now is uh you know her getting to go to PDX like her and I both went and did San Antonio cocktail conference a couple years ago Katie and Tony have taken me and AJ and Dalton and other people to, to San Antonio over the years. They do things in Kentucky all the time. And then just outside of like our own work stuff, like getting to do run amok or some of the competition stuff that like past done and I've done, you know, it's, it's, it's really cool. Though, like Pensacola is being put on the map slowly, but surely. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I just hope that continues to make those people in our industry here that, that see us doing these things want to get into it too. Yeah. I mean, for, for a drinking Navy town, it's nice to have quality as well as quantity at this yeah. point. And, and this is something I want to circle back to coming back to competition. Yeah, I'm very because, tangential. So you got to like, well, no, you, your biggest problem is you're way more humble than you need to be. <laughs> and you've done pretty darn well at Diageo and other competitions. And that's something I wanted to kind of hone in on as well, because not just the industry, but you in particular, like, by the time we met, um, I didn't really become a regular at Old Hickory till about the end of year one. Okay. And at that point, that's when you and a couple other people that I was introduced to started really branching out and doing competitions. And that that's something that always intrigued me because I saw the pictures. I think it was it was one of the competitions where you were judged by Todd Richmond yeah. and someone I didn't know. And the pictures I saw coming out of that, it looked like the most amazing like backdrop for a competition and your cocktails looked amazing. I couldn't smell them, but I felt like I could <laughs> smell them just seeing the garnishes you used. And you had a one in particular that it's almost like you built the cocktail upside down, if I remember correctly. Yes. And uh. <laughs> so... So going from five and a half and, you know, working under Pat for a while, wine bar to Old Hickory, and then to that. I mean, there's, what goes into that? Because you're obviously playing around with concepts when you can. And at Old, anytime I go to Old Hickory, they talk about R&D. I've right. never seen it, but I've heard about it. And it's a lot of behind the scenes drinking is what it yeah. boils down to. Yeah, but I mean... I'll, Another tangent, I'm doing a competition with Andy and some other people if you want in on it. Uh-oh. Kind of like the similar to Joe Rogan's Sober October. We're going to do Jackass January and do a fitness competition. So if you want in on that, let me know. Uh-oh, but no. we said, so we're we going to do this totally sober or not? And Andy just kind of is like, guys, I drink for a living. Yeah, to- to- totally <laughs> sober is not 100%. I mean, I- actually, it is very, very doable, but I, I have no interest in, in total sobriety. I. Yeah, I've definitely toned down my drinking over the last couple of years um, as I've gotten like more into, you know, essentially more into fitness, more into running and more into mm-hmm. working out. And I I'd rather go home after one drink or no drinks and be able to go run or exercise in the morning than feel like hell and try to <laughs> work my way through it because I'm just too old for that. That was my my terrible Danny Glover impersonation. <laughs> um, <laughs> but. So, so yeah, to circle back around yes. to the R and D, like you, you went from you know the the first craft cocktail bar in a small market to competing on a very large scale, right? Against a lot of other top people. I mean, that's exponential progression inside of five years. Yeah, it's it's huge, and and a lot of it comes from, like you say, starting out with you know Pat five and a half and and Jackson's with Josh, like getting honed in on the the basics, knowing. I, I have a ridiculous, like, classic cocktail database just in my head, and I don't remember my own phone number sometimes. But 
it's one of those you got to walk before you run kind of things. Like if I didn't have that, then my creativity would probably be be pretty stifled. Because um, I do a lot of my kind of create create creativity. Yeah, that's the word I'm looking for. Uh, You're a writer, aren't you? <laughs> clearly. <laughs> I'm also 100% sober, so my brain's a little slow. Um, I'm wittier when I'm drinking. Um, yeah, that's where most of my creativity comes from, is a lot of like kind of plug and play. Like, okay, I like this, this sidecar recipe. Let's try swapping this out for this, this out for this. And you, you essentially create a whole new drink, but you use like the skeleton of something else. Mm-hmm. And that's usually where I start. And then sometimes we'll go a little bit crazier, sometimes not. But... Um, yeah, it, it was a, a fun thing. The, the world-class stuff was the first major competition I did. Um, we'd always done little kind of local competitions around Pensacola uh, for years, but I, I kind of threw my hat in the ring in Diageo World Class in 2015, I think. Yeah. Um, that was the year I got accepted to that and then went to Orlando for the regional finals. And strange little tie-in from Pensacola to Orlando for that where it was held, um, I don't remember the name of the place off the top of my head, but it was essentially Seville Quarter at one point tried to do a secondary location in Orlando. Oh, wow. And that was the place. Okay. So it looks very much like the, the piano bar in Seville Quarter <laughs> throughout the whole building. It's that like a three-story building, and it's yeah, it looks just like it. Yeah, I saw a lot of heavy wooden crown mold. It looked very yep. classic, and that definitely explains yep. it because that's totally Seville's aesthetic. Yeah, if you're ever in Orlando and you check that place out, you'll be like, this looks like the piano bar. <laughs> <clears throat> um, so, yeah, getting getting to do that there it was essentially Diageo World Class is like Bartender Olympics. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not one particular thing that they hone in on where you do this thing, they judge you, you sit around and wait to find out who wins. It's, you know, three challenges at least, depending on which round you make it to. Um, I didn't make it past the regionals, but there was three pretty intense parts for, for that whenever I was there. And if you look at like the roster of who's who have, who's gone through world class over the years, it's most of those people are, are pretty well known or they're running amazing bars in Chicago or New York or LA or, or something like that. It's, and then there's this schmuck from Pensacola, Florida. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. I just I, maybe they confused my application with somebody else, but it <laughs> no. was it was still it was a really great time and it was it was such a learning experience because I had to. I spent two or three months kind of focusing on each aspect of, of what this competition was going to be. Is like this round, I need to be ready for this, this, mm-hmm. and this. Even the drive down, uh, one of the rounds was, was just called behind the stick, but basically it was a. Uh, they had three hats where they, one hat they pull out a uh, spirit and it would be you know, whatever was in the Diageo portfolio at the time. And another was like a sensation they were going for and in a style where it would be like, well, I'll just tell you what I got. I got uh, Ciroc Amaretto, I think was my, my spirit. Uh, I'm not going to say anything good or bad about that. Uh, <laughs> and then spicy, like digestif. So <laughs> those are three things that should not go together. So those are like the things you can't prepare for, but you've got to just know it's, like the five and a half thing is like knowing what to do with every item yeah. on that back bar. Um, it's luckily, like I was cocktail prepared. Mad Libs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I never thought about that before, but that is <laughs> that is absolutely what that is. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's being ha- having all the tools in your your toolkit to be able to to pull that off at a moment's notice is definitely something you have because I've seen people crack into that. I've seen people excel into that. Luckily, I. I I did well enough not to embarrass myself, but not well enough to go on to the next round. Um, one of my judges for that was actually uh, John Lermayer, who uh, passed away earlier this year, but the, the founder and owner of Sweet Liberty in Miami. I had no idea who the hell John Lemaire was at the time. <laughs> but when I made my drink with the wonderful Ciroc Amaretto, um, I gave it to him and he, he took a drink of it. He's like, I did not think I was gonna like this. He's like, I'll be honest. I'm going to drink this. I would never order another one. And I was like, you know what? I'm fine with that because it was completely on, on the fly. Like had to make a spicy digestif or amaretto vodka cocktail. And I want to say there's like Tabasco and chartreuse in there. And it was a very weird, like spicy, sour kind of thing. But you know what? From, from John LeMayer, that was actually a pretty, pretty great praise of like, this is good enough to finish, but I'm good with this one. Yeah. So. 
<clears throat> well, after, out of like say sixty possible combinations of <laughs> at least of, of tags and those those three hats, it sounds yeah. like he got like the uh, the most difficult set of circumstances there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. He did, he did say that was one of the worst draws he'd ever seen. So <laughs> I don't feel too bad about about that. Um, and, and then, you know, other rounds, like the one you were talking about where it looked like I, I built a drink upside down, uh, that was my, my speed and efficiency round for world class. And you built an upside down cocktail for speed and efficiency. That's, I, I built that's a, cool. it was a, basically a hovering cocktail. Um, okay. so I, I took a kind of a V champagne flute, cut the top off of a lemon and basically used it to kind of jam it down or use tongs to kind of jam it down into the V to where it basically created an air vacuum on the bottom. Okay. And then just built a cocktail up on top of that. Um, I don't remember what the cocktail was. Honestly, it was three years ago, four years ago, and it was it was good. I remember that because I, I do remember very specifically liking all the the drinks I made for my my speed and efficiency round because I practiced them so many times and honed the recipe. Um, I just don't remember what that particular one was. I'll tell you why it stood out to me because I saw the picture. And I never forgot the picture. <laughs> Because the cocktail was in the foreground. I don't know if there was a photographer who took that or if someone with like a really good phone at the time took that. But the cocktail was in the foreground and slightly out of focus in the background. You've got, like, got your arms crossed, your back while the judges are looking at it. And Todd Richmond has been over in the background like Johnny Bench looking at it <laughs> like he just, you know, it was such an intense photo for a, ju- a cocktail judging. It stood out to me. And because of the lighting in that room, I didn't think that was a... a a lemon or, or he says lemon, mm-hmm. right? I thought that was a basil leaf or something. Like I thought you had somehow built a cocktail on top of a leaf. And I was like, <laughs> how? <laughs> Tremendously steady hands. Uh, yeah, no, that was, I, I remember the picture you're talking about. That was uh, Todd and uh, Sean Kenyon from uh, Williams and Graham in Denver. Uh, he was one of the people that was helping out on that. So that was uh, the first time I actually got to meet Sean too, which was really cool because his bars are, are incredible. Um, so, so getting that like momentary like, Holy shit! How did you do that kind of thing from from them was very cool because yeah, you know those are two people I, I definitely look up to in the industry. And, yeah, uh, grab, grabbing their attention with something as simple as you know judging or jamming a, a, a lemon top into the <laughs> glass. <laughs> well, I had just got into cocktail photography at the time, and I thought it was the coolest look. So no. it stood out. to I'm me. I'm still and, very proud of it. It's still, I still have it in my favorites on my phone. So yeah, no, it was it was cool, man. And and again. To see people just take this small market, turn it into something cool, and just take it in front of people like that. Yeah. It brings out a lot of hometown pride in me, but it's also just exciting because the for lack of a better term, Pensacola is still cheap. There's yeah. opportunities everywhere. And it's really cool to see people taking advantage of them. It's like, oh, we have so much room to work here. Let's just scratch our name on this planet. Let's do it, you know? Right. And and, and- I think I mean, Pensacola's come a very long way. It's still got a long way to go, obviously, but it's it's growing for sure. And that's a really cool thing to see, especially being being born and raised here. You know, I haven't always lived here, but this is this is home. It always has been. Yeah. Um, and getting to do stuff like that. And, you know, last year, sorry, earlier this year when I got to do the Bombay thing, like when the news journal contacted me about wanting to do a story on it, I was like, holy crap, this is you know, really cool. I was almost more excited for that than, <laughs> than doing Diageo because nobody called me when I did Diageo. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, doing the, doing the Bombay thing was, was super, super fun. Cause they actually came to the restaurant, did like a photo shoot, interviewed me. I'm like, I remember that. Who, who the hell am I? <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's great. Like you said, to give, you know, my, my home, a platform or, or a stage, I guess it would be a, a better way to put it. It's like getting, yeah. getting the spotlight shown on it a little bit is, is, incredibly humbling and it's a huge honor to like be one of the people that has done that yeah you, you draw in the spotlight and i feel like and i, I feel like you and Which i is relate. funny because i hate the spotlight <laughs> and i feel like you and i relate on that because i hate the spotlight too like that's not the spotlight that's the eye of sauron like don't right. look at me yeah. it's gonna hurt but you're, you're gonna see my soul and you don't want that it's dark <laughs> well, at least you still have one uh, there, it's yeah slim I, i'm saving a little bit just for that last jelly donut i need to bargain for <laughs> <laughs> before you kick off yep but, but um uh speaking of like you know other markets you what's pretty cool as well is that you worked in new orleans for a while you didn't just work in new orleans you were wearing a white jacket at the sazerac <laughs> bar at one point and you know that's contrasting that new orleans is one of the coolest industry areas in the world oh, yeah. and 
you know, have you seen some of that make it over here? Like some of what, because Pensacola is a pretty tight knit community and just from, uh, I'll, I'll stroke your ego a little bit. All right. If other places I go in new Orleans, people know your name. Cause I'll say, I'm, you know, I'll say, Oh yeah, I'm in from Pensacola. And they'll say, Oh, I know some people in Pensacola. It's like, do you know Jeff not? Like, yeah, I know Jeff. <laughs> I tended bar with him. I tended bar with his wife. I know yeah. him well, you know, and that's, I, I've gotten in three different places between the quarter and the garden district. I mean, you know, it's, it's kind of cool to see how, just how close they are. Cause I mean, New Orleans, not a huge town, but there's a lot of people there. And to yeah, so it's, it's kind of like very similar to Pensacola in that way. It's like, it's not as big of a scene or a community as you might think, but it's still just as tight knit, uh, which is really, really cool. So luckily I, I knew quite a few people before I moved over there. Um, and, and got to make even more friends when I was over there. And, and it definitely is home 2.0, <laughs> I mm. guess would be the easiest way to put it. Like that, that is a place that always calls me and always will. And, and I love going every chance I get. And I would love to end back up there someday mm. if, if at all possible. Um, you know, I always said I won't, I won't turn down a cool job no matter where it is. So yeah. I, I love Pensacola. I'm happy to be here, but you know, the right people come knocking, I'll definitely entertain the idea. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, so you've done this for a while. What What is your, your ideal dream? Like, is your ideal dream to get like a silent partner and open your own concept somewhere? Or would you just be content to just work in the industry and help the people you can just be in it? Or because if, if someone came up to you right now and said, you know, we're going to write you a blank check to open a place in New Orleans, let's say, like for your taste, would that be like a, an after hours place, a hotel martini bar or an independent funky place somewhere. I mean, what, what draws you in? Like, what are the sort of things that you find yourself gravitating toward, you know, as you, as you continue to, to grow and to build places up and make them better? I mean, what is, what sets you on fire? Where are you looking for? I, I feel like it's like an ever changing answer too, depending on you could probably ask 20 bartenders the same thing at, at 10 different stages of their career. And you're <laughs> going to get 200 different answers. Cause you know, if you would ask me, you know, Two or three years ago, before I moved to New Orleans, I, I would have wanted you know maybe a you know a quiet little speakeasy. In New Orleans, I might have just wanted you know a really nice hotel bar. Now, for me now, I, I'm thinking more like you know blank check style situation. Like I would probably be very happy with like small little you know thirty forty seat neighborhood bar. Just you know make make good cocktails and a place that. People want to come to you know two or three times a week, not necessarily a tourist trap where everybody's coming through and you're serving 500 people a night because that's right. the the hot place to be. I I don't really care. Like that's not I, I like I said I don't not big on the spotlight. So mm -hmm. I just want a place that people are comfortable with. And I know everybody says that, but that's you know it's a genuine thing. And I think once you reach a certain point in your life, you're and you're okay with where you are. Like I think that's just something that comes through is. Yeah, I just I want a place where people want to come and hang, and they're, I'm proud of what I'm putting across the bar, whether it's, you know, a shot and a beer or, you know, the best food gray you've ever had. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that I make the best food gray. I don't want people like coming after me. <laughs> There's people from New Orleans getting in the cars Ooh, yeah, right now. Yeah, so I could feel like the hairs bristling on my neck. I know, like, <laughs> Mark Shetler's going to be texting me and wondering what the hell I'm saying. Uh, I tried to meet him last time I was in the quarter. Ah, you're not missing much. No, I, I love that guy. <laughs> Yeah. No, you. Uh, and any guy that will bring me Juan's flying burrito when I'm like trying to unpack a moving van uh, is immediately one of my favorite people. Yeah, did it hurt when he fell from heaven? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that is that's that's pretty Oof. awesome right there. Yeah, that was that was clutch. And yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I've been very lucky. Uh, I mean, I, New Orleans was was one of the best experiences of my my life. Um, you know, there, there was a lot of good and a lot of bad that came from that city, but I, it was. Right place, right time, and like I said, I, I would happily go back, and it's yeah. always a place that holds my my heart and my attention. And yeah, yeah. and neighborhood bars is something they do well because Very that's well. something. Are you familiar with? Uh, have you heard about oh, uh, Ray Olenberg, who's a he was a like professor emeritus at UWF, and he wrote a book called The Great Good Place. It was on my mind the other day. I found out he's still alive. He's pretty old now, but I didn't realize he was still alive. I think he's working on a new book. He was in the news journal the other day. That's yeah. how I found out that he was still, you know, living. Still kicking. Because <laughs> his his first book, The Great Good Place, has been around for a long time. 
So I assumed he just wasn't here anymore, that he passed on. Well, it turns out he, he's still writing. He's still active. I'm, I'm highly entertaining the thought of rereading his book and then inviting him over here because he'd be interesting to talk to. But he, he basically, to get back to my point, he, was, he wrote a book about the value of neighborhood gathering places. You know, and it, whether that's a, a you know a German beer garden or an Italian cafe or any of these places, there's usually some sort of beverage component, often a food component. Right. And if you look in the home countries, they're always within neighborhoods. So mm-hmm. you have your you know England, you have your neighborhood pub, you have you know your local cafe, whatever. Well, and when people came over to America, they brought that with them. So in New York, up until Prohibition, you had thriving beer gardens where entire families would come. You know, it wasn't some den of iniquity like the, you know, the abstinence movement said it was. It was family-oriented. What did they know, anyway? No. Yeah. <laughs> we all knew who won that argument. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the... I grew up in a teetotaling household. So for me to be as involved as I am in, <laughs> in just the marketing side of the, the restaurant and bar industry now is kind of hilarious. Yeah, it's huge. If you look at you know how I grew up and the trajectory now, it's not likely. <laughs> right. I'm very happy it happened, but it's it's highly unlikely given the way I, I came up. But anyway, the you know prohibition killed off a lot of that, and you know the lack of urban planning in a lot of cities killed it off the mm-hmm. rest of the way because you have just blocks of houses or blocks of apartment buildings, and then there's an abrupt shift, and you're in the commercial area again. Right. So the there aren't as many neighborhood spots as there could be or should be. But that's something that I love about New Orleans. They were able to preserve that because, you know, you go up Esplanade, it's like house, house, restaurant, house, house, bar, house, house, coffee shop. Yep. And I mean, those are a lot of those are neighborhoods where it takes a lot to have a house, but there's still the look of a neighborhood. It still looks cohesive, you know, it right. still provides value for the community there. And that's something that I'm really hoping bleeds over in Pensacola while we're having this renaissance so that they can look at New Orleans. You know what? Esplanade looks pretty cool. Let's do that on more residential streets in East Hill or North Hill or whatever. Yeah, we've definitely got the the, the room to do it. And I, I agree. I would like to see more of that. Um, I know over out of it was done at more out of necessity in New Orleans because, you know, there wasn't a lot of empty real estate to be had for for parts of that city. So it was just like. This has been here. We're not going to move it. Let's leave it here. We'll build around it, or you know, we're not going to rezone. Um, I don't know how feasible it's going to be with certain parts of Pensacola, but I would like to see more of it for sure. That's why I think it's so great about like the Mag up in East Pensacola Heights. Yeah. Like that's the quintessential neighborhood bar. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's what kind of we wanted to do with Union Public House whenever we were starting that up. Is you know that was hell us in the name like public house that's right. where pub came from it was where people went to meet you know um I, I would like to see that develop into more of a neighborhood place which I, I think it does a good job of but i would like to see similar things to start to happen I, you know <clears throat> there's like no good bars on the west side that i know of at least please change my mind but mm-hmm. you know out, outside of the downtown area or very close to the downtown area we've it's pretty hard to find a decent bar I know we've got like George up on Ninth Avenue now, mm-hmm. and they're they're pretty dang good. Um, but that yeah, was a ballsy move on their part to exit the downtown <laughs> core and go that far. It seems to be doing really north. well, from what I gather, too. Yeah, I mean, I've only been in there once or twice, but yeah, they're they're doing good. I still haven't been there since they moved. I mean, they built. Are you heartbroken? Up, say what? You're heartbroken, aren't you? Yeah. Um, not quite. Oh. close. Heart heart bent. Okay. <laughs> there, there's a key scratch. Yeah, fair. Totally fair. But no, I I love George. I, I love how they built up a solid following and then then they moved mm-hmm. and they had they were, had enough loyal people that their following went with them. So that because I wanted them to do well. You oh, know, yeah. I wanted them to keep their people. I'm glad they did because I'm always afraid that you know all the all the upsiders who love to be on Palafox Street won't won't go north of Cervantes if they right. can help it. But I'm I'm glad they are. I feel like they might even do better out there than they are or than they were downtown because there's no other game in that area other than Fridays and Chili's and Applebee's and stuff yeah. like that. It's like an actual like local local owned, local operated, you know, place in the middle of chain franchise central could crush. So yeah. I yeah. hope I hope they do. No, I, th- I think there's potential because I the last time I had dinner up that way was um, Miller's Ale House, which is just again, you know, franchise concept. Yeah. Good, you know, yeah. food's, food's yeah. really good. You get there, what you but, pay for, and but it's it's not doesn't have a ton of personality compared to 
you know, because George is pretty much like the perfect immigrant tale in Pensacola. Yeah. You know, they they Russian family built it up, best food you could hope for. You know, wonderful coffee bar, strong bakery. pastry game. Oh yeah. That, that's actually one reason I don't go there more often <laughs> is walking past that glass case is physically difficult. Yeah. It's like our Taco Bell conversation before the mic's rolled. Oh, Saying yeah. no is so hard. As as much as much as you can get an eighty dollar steak at four places downtown, you can drive five minutes yep. and get a hundred tacos for the same money. <laughs> and I would, I would, I would I would eat eighty tacos. Uh, and I would just sit there and disappoint myself. <laughs> Well, I know I know we share an Oreo fixation as well, oh. so I definitely feel your pain on. Have you tried the new peppermint bark Oreos? Not that, yet. That's a thing. You, I didn't you, know that was a thing. Thank you for that. I was doing so good this week. <laughs> <laughs> I want to apologize to Annie, your wife, if you're moody tomorrow. <laughs> so. Yeah, that's that's gonna happen. Publix is on the way home. Yeah, I, I don't I don't know if they're at Publix. I, I I'll find them. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know where you are, but I will find you. A, a particular set of skills. <laughs> yeah, just like a truffle pig for junk food. <laughs> and they fed me, so now it's worse than ever. Yeah, yeah you're going to keep coming back. Yeah. So so right now, you're at Iron? Yes. Yeah. I'm, I'm, honestly, like I said earlier, it's one of, one of the best gigs I've ever had, man. It's good money. I'm proud of everything I'm doing. The, our, our drink game is, is super good. Uh, the food Alex does is ridiculous. Between you and he and Brett, y'all really, y'all lead that place really well. Because, I mean, Brett's the bar manager, but you came with a following. So I kind of look at y'all as a triumvirate there, you know? Well, well that, that was fun to do is, you know, I've, I've ran places, I've been in charge, I've been the, the guy in the spotlight. Um, and I, I still do tend to get a little bit of the spotlight because Brett's also a very, very humble guy and doesn't really mm-hmm. put himself out there that much. Um, but when... Uh, Campbell, the former head bartender, stepped down. Brett had been with Iron since pretty much the beginning. So they were like, well, we're going to give him a chance to, to take over. Would you be okay coming in as, you know, just a bartender as, like, his number two? I'm like, hell yeah, absolutely. Like, on top of the fact that I love the place, like, I don't need to be in charge of anything. Mm-hmm. I would like to, again, at some point in my career, for sure. Oh, of course. But Brett's doing a really good job. It's nice to see him kind of come into his own, like, learning how to, to essentially run a bar. And I, I told him very early on when I was there, I was like, I'm never going to try to, you know, sidestep you or, you know, make you make a decision one way or the other. It's like, I'll be here to offer advice or try to steer you in a direction. If if I see you, you know, start to fuck up, then I'll I'll intervene. But I haven't had to do that. Yeah. You know, there's been a couple of times where I've been like, oh, hey, I know you probably haven't done this before. You know, here's what I would do in this situation. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's been pretty, pretty hands off for me, which is nice, like. You know, we, we work on cocktails together. I show up, I make drinks, I leave. You know, we tackle some of the prep. You know, we kind of assign who does what. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. I've started to miss that life because after the last year of building a business, I, I'm like, you know, I used to be able to just leave work at work. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, there's there's definitely value in that. I was talking to Pepper the other day. You know, he's serving at the district. Yeah. And he's, you know, managed so many places and people keep saying, you know, why are you serving when you've been a manager? And he's like, I have none of the headaches and I make better money. Uh-huh. <laughs> so definitely sleeping better at night, probably. Oh yeah, that's for sure. Yeah. And Pepper's so good at wine. You know, he's he's doing some great wine sales at the district because you know he can talk about it. not yeah. not every server is a level two psalm and can <laughs> recommend what goes with what. No. So that's that's pretty cool. So I mean, I. I I find myself a little bit envious of that sometimes because I'm I'm tired of being in charge of things. <laughs> it, it, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm not gonna lie; it's it's really nice. And but like I said, I, I I know for a fact I will be in charge of something again at some point, and I'm ready to do so when need be. But I'm not going to just jump into anything. Like I said, I'm very happy at Iron. So yeah. if I'm there for the next five years doing exactly what I'm doing now, great. If you know, not gonna happen. But if you know, Jeffrey Morgenthaler or Jim Meehan calls me tomorrow, not that either one of them know or care who I am. That's what um, this podcast is for. I, I will I will go. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I have actually met both of them, and they're both very nice people, but they have no idea who the hell I am, nor, nor should they. <laughs> um, yeah, but, you know, Sean Kenyon wants me to go out to Denver. I'd entertain it. Oh, yeah, that's for sure. Like I said, these phone calls ain't happening. So <laughs> until they do, iron is safe. Yeah. 
But I mean, it's it's cool to see because that is probably the most seamless institution. I'm not trying to be a flatterer here. I said this to Alex as well, but it's just so cool because y'all all do your job so well, and you're so you don't just function well. It's like you're all individually good at what you do, but then as a team, it's just no matter what night I go there, whether it's you or Brett behind the bar. I mean, it's just it's guaranteed a good experience. You yeah, know? We, we we're lucky enough. We have you know. I'm not going to lie, I'm a, I'm a pretty damn good bartender, and so is Brett, and so is Amber. Mm-hmm. All those chefs back in the kitchen, any one of those guys could be and probably will be at one point or another running their own kitchen, mm-hmm. if not their own restaurant. Yeah. You know, it's our wait staff. There's, there's not a weak link in that chain. It's what happens when you hire professionals to do a job. Mm-hmm. And don't get me wrong, we goof off as much, if not more so, like per capita, because there's only a few of us. <laughs> than than any other staff I've ever been on, but when it's time to work, we work. And we, yeah, we do it well because we're all competent and, like I said, professional. So well, it gives you balance. Yeah, Every, you everything happy. from our, our hostesses to our dishwashers. It's yeah, it's a really solid foundation of a team, and that's it's something you don't see very often. Oh yeah, I mean that's something that um, I try really hard not to bring up turkey and the wolf in every conversation. But last time I went there, I went there Sorry. to. <laughs> It's hard, man. It's hard. Oh, I'm uh, choking on my, my <laughs> Starbucks hot chocolate over here. Oh, man. My, my big dream is to meet Mason's brother, the photographer, because he is so accomplished in his field. I'm just like, I just want to hear yeah. you talk. I just it, and their talk. shots are so beautiful, too. Yeah. and But to come back to what I was saying, you talk about goofing off a lot. The last time I went there on a Monday, so it's like the last day of the week they're open yeah. before they take Tuesday off. And I get there at 11 o'clock on a Monday. All the tourists have left town, you know, so there's mm-hmm. a little window. And it was mostly industry people on their day off oh, going yeah. to get a sandwich there. And, you know, every time I've ever gone there, my food comes out in five minutes. That's perfect, you know. But you go in there at 11 o'clock right when they're opening, all the bartenders are still jamming out to 90s hip hop mm-hmm. and just jumping up and down behind the bar. And, like, I love seeing that because, you know, you see me from the outside, you from the inside, how busy it can get and how, like, hyper-focused you have to be. But those little moments where you can just like let your hair down and have a good time, that's what makes coming yeah. to work worth doing, you know? And and that's and that's something I feel like every business is the same in a certain extent. I mean, I, I get that. I mean, there's times when I'm tied to a tripod all day shooting a hotel and I'm just, you know, I'm in close orbit of three sticks for twelve mm-hmm. hours at a time. But then I go like shoot old hickory or something and it's just I can have this really short lens on the camera so I can have a drink in my other hand and yep. just shoot one hand. Yeah. And those little like relaxed moments, they just, they make everything better, you know? And yeah. it's, it, it, it's cool for me to hear that about iron. It's like that, that like, John Stewart moment of Zen on the daily show. It's yeah. like, that's, that's what you need. <laughs> like I know before shift, it's a crapshoot of what everybody's listening to. Cause I mean, we'll have one of our sous chefs, AJ, uh, has a very eclectic taste in music. We'll put it that way. Um, <laughs> And I still can't tell whether he actually likes Nickelback or likes to just put on Nickelback. <laughs> Either way, we all sing along at the top of our lungs. Uh, the other day was Avril Lavigne, and nobody was mad about it. Um, but into the night, like I'm, I'm weird at the end of the night. Like not so much at Iron, uh, but when I was at Old Hickory, I liked Silence because, like, after almost a thousand people coming through the doors or whatever, and people not yelling at me, but yelling to get their orders out because it's a loud, raucous place, like. When everybody's out for me at Old Hickory, it was lights up, music off. I just Mm -hmm. wanted silence. Like, take the trash out, smoke my, like, post-shift cigarette, and count the money in quiet. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, maybe turn some music back on after that. But Iron doesn't necessarily make me have to do that. I can usually, you know, carry on with the music. But, yeah, that's like, I don't know. I I think it's amazing because a lot of places, if you're not, like, if you're not tonic in, in the quarter or, you know, Turkey and the Wolf where you can play, probably play whatever you want, you have like a playlist or a vibe that you try to create through your music because music's such a, a huge part of any, any bar or restaurant, mm-hmm. whether you realize it or not. Um, it might not always be to your taste or to your liking. So if it's like when you have the ability to change it or play something else, you're going to, you know, throw on... Megadeth or Panic at the Disco or Frank Sinatra or whatever you're feeling that you haven't been able to listen to for the last eight hours of your shift. Right. It's, it's time to, to switch it up and play it as loud as you can usually. Yeah. So. Now that silence at the end of the night, would you describe yourself as a natural introvert? Like do you, do you turn it on when you go to work or do you, or is that kind of your baseline all the time? It's just being 
not afraid to kickstart those conversations and be around people. And I, I don't fear or shy away from conversation. Um, I almost never really will instigate it. Mm-hmm. I'm usually a pretty like kind of quiet to myself person most of the time. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, yeah, definitely. I would say I lean towards towards introvert. Yeah. Even behind the bar, I'm not necessarily an extrovert. I'm, I was never, you know, I love Andy. I was never Andy at Old Hickory. Andy's a different character. I, you know, I was. Hey, what can I get you tonight? You guys want to talk about some whiskey? Yeah. I'm I'm here. If you don't, I'll just be in the corner. Don't yeah. mind me. <laughs> me. Meanwhile, my wife walks into Old Hickory and Andy erupts into a war cry from the other end of the bar. Andy! Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> He's got the the Tom Toms back there. He's just playing them for no reason whatsoever. <laughs> but, uh, that that was Andy, and God bless him for it. It's just you know one one of my my favorite people on the planet is is Danny Neff, who used to work at that Holiday Cocktail Bar in New York, and Holiday is essentially, for lack of a better term, like a karaoke bar. Like mm-hmm. everybody there is. Any video I've ever seen from the place, everybody there is just singing at the top of their lungs with whatever is on the radio at any given time. And and I met Danny through Camp Runamuck, and the, the man is a, a walking fucking party. Like he was carrying around a boombox, and you know whatever was on was what everybody was singing. And yeah. I can go along with that, but I'm never the person that, that brings that. And I mm-hmm. don't care to be. I just don't have that inside of me. So, you know, I'm I'm a pretty chill dude for the most part. I'll, I'll let loose and sing along, but I'm not going to be the person that, that starts it, I guess. Well, I, I think I, I just respect your ability, anyone's ability, really, to be in front of that many people on an individual level for eight to ten hours at a time. Because I feel like I could, if I was learn to make some basic cocktails... I could bartend comfortably for about 20 minutes <laughs> before I'm just like, why are all these people looking at me? I'm right. tired of this. And I just like throw down my apron and run out the back door. <laughs> gotta go guys. Yeah. Y'all, y'all are really nice, but I'm, I'm, I'm I got a thing. Did he just shriek and run out? I don't know. What <laughs> no, I, I'm, Is that a puddle of urine? I, I have been called, and this is no joke. I've been called the human equivalent of grumpy cat. Um, <laughs> and it's not necessarily that I'm grumpy. I'm just, I'm quiet. And I, I have whatever the the male equivalent of resting bitch face is. Like I just I'm not a naturally smiley person. I I I guess it's still RBF if it's like resting bartender face, where I'm like <laughs> I'm focused on what I'm doing. I'm not just trying to sit there and smile like a jackass. Mm-hmm. Um, just I look awkward if I do it. I know this, so <laughs> you know if I smile naturally in conversation, it's genuine. I'm not not putting it on. So yeah, I just it it does take a certain amount of. Uh, Liking people, and believe it or not, despite the whole human grumpy cat thing, I really do like people. <laughs> I, I yeah. nine times out of ten, if you see me talking to somebody at the bars because I want to, I can find my ways out of conversations most of the time if I need to. So, if I'm talking to somebody, it's because I care to actually be talking to them. So that that's nice about, especially being at a place like Iron, was I, I have a little bit more of that time because we're not high volume. You know, mm-hmm. we're a pretty quiet-ish restaurant bar. So, you know, if I got. 10, 12 people at the bar, I can I can have time with all of them. And that that's incredible to me to watch because on paper, iron should be chaos. But y'all, <laughs> but y'all keep everything so like, and again, I'm not behind the scenes. I don't know how many fires you put out, but it's... It's it, the duck thing. You know, the legs are going crazy under the surface. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but I mean, y'all, y'all present, even with an open kitchen and a bar that's literally, you know, right there in the dining room. Just everyone looks collected. There's no loud noises coming from the kitchen. There's no like... French chef throwing cleavers and screaming. It's Alex quietly finishing dishes. You know, it's just, it's cool to see. Well, really I think is. it's because everybody knows that Alex would just end them in a heartbeat if he chose to. <laughs> like, he's, he's probably got that place so booby trapped and we don't even know it. Like, he, he flips a switch where you think it's going to be a heat lamp and somebody's falling through the floor. I don't, I think, that's how I imagine like the deep, dark secrets of iron. Yeah. Um, yeah. Look, that's why I stay on Alex's good side. <laughs> he, he will for always get his, his post shift drink anytime he wants it as fast as I can get it to him. Just so mm-hmm. I stay in that good grace. Yep. And he, he posts just enough guns on Instagram <laughs> that you, you know where he stands. I, I've <laughs> sold him one of my old guns before. So yeah, oh, I, yeah? I, I know, uh, I know for a fact he's at least got one. <laughs> yeah. I, I asked him about that. And he's like, no, nah, not in the restaurant. There's alcohol yeah. there. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. But it's a nice vision, though, just to imagine. Stop that now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> sir, yes, sir. <laughs> click, click. Point taken. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but, yeah. but, yeah, so, Jeff, um, 
Are you uh, using your Instagram professionally at all? I feel like we're kind of winding things down here. And do you want people to be able to find you online at all? Or yeah, just, absolutely. Can um, we just tell them to come to the restaurant? Yes, please come to the restaurant. <laughs> I, I love it when people come to the restaurant. Um, you know, bills to pay, dog to feed, all that fun stuff. I like taking trips. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, uh, my Instagram is uh, infamous underscore drinks. Um, I don't, I think I have a Twitter. I don't actually use it. So <laughs> don't even bother on that one. Uh, I'm, I'm not really using it much professionally right now. I've kind of just been working on stuff for the restaurant um, and haven't haven't been super focused on much in the way of, of cocktail creation the last couple of months. So, But usually when I do, you'll start seeing stuff pop up on, on Instagram. I go through streaks where it's like, no drink pictures for months and then it's just like every day there's like two or three and it's because i'm like in the phase of like finalizing all these things i've been bouncing around in my head for a couple months so and then of course you know depending on the time of year if i'm off and gone at you know tales of the cocktail or, or run amok or, or something like that then you'll see all sorts of random pictures of the chaos that those <laughs> events always seem to, to bring so it's yeah. always fun to watch it, it's always fun to do this will be the the fifth year i'll be at run amok and it's it's exciting. Yeah, so. I never see a ton of pictures from Run Amok. I hear what happens there stays there. For the most part, that is, that is correct. <laughs> There's um, always like one cool group shot that Blake Jones takes, and, yeah. that's, and that becomes the Well, the that, that's also a thing that he started stressing a couple of years ago when, when Blake went from being a, a camper to actually working for Lush Life is one thing they talk about at the beginning of each session, which I really do appreciate is, you know, like, hey, they... They have us here for a reason. Me and my photography team, my videography team, we're here for a reason. So we're experiencing this through the lens. So you don't have to. So put your phones down. Be in the moment. Yeah. You know, just so appreciate it for what it is. So I, I feel like the amount of photography on the camper side of Run Amok in the last like three years or so has gone down drastically. Yeah. Because they, they take amazing pictures and they seem to capture everything anyway. Mm -hmm. At least everything that can be captured. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it really hasn't become an unnecessary thing for, for me being behind the scenes and being part of leadership where I'm like back in the kitchen making drinks and stuff like that most of the time. I tend to, to snap a lot of photos of, of that, just us goofing off in the kitchen or right. you know, pouring a case of rumple mints into a five gallon bucket or something like that. Ugh, bad nightmares <laughs> like that. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean that's that's usually what, what my Instagram is for is the stuff that you're not going to see through Blake's amazing photography. So. Yeah. Cool, man. Well, Jeff, I really, really appreciate you coming out tonight because, like I said, the minute I was done with Alex, he was texting me the next day saying, you got to do one with Jeff, do one with Jeff. So. No, I, I was very happy to. I'm, I'm glad you let me come and kind of ramble around for, for an hour or so. This was, this was good. I always enjoy talking to you, man. Yeah, man. It's always good seeing you, Jeff. Thanks, buddy.